Soviets. Soviets. Get off your Laban's realm. Big thank you to our sponsor today, Wargaming, and their game World of Tanks, a massive online free-to-play tank warfare strategy game with over 150 million players worldwide. All of the tanks are true-to-life models researched by the big man himself, with realistic upgrades that can be earned and applied to enhance your tank as you progress, like a fire extinguisher. Don't go into a match without a fire extinguisher. Unless you're some kind of crazy masochist, in which case you're probably playing Japanese tanks to where I don't think a fire extinguisher will really make a difference and your fate's already sealed. Anyways, I digress. The strategy changes between vehicles and maps. The only thing that doesn't change is corners. You will always want corners to be your very best friends. Love them, get to know them, pay them if you have to, and before you know it, you'll be seal clubbing with the best of them. Take part in joint operations to spot, track, and destroy enemy units by downloading World of Tanks for free using the link down below in my code TANKTASTIC. Never thought that was a word I'd say, but I like it. To unlock a free bonus T-127 Soviet tank, 500 gold, and 7 days of premium time. It's a good time and it helps out the channel. And I could use the help. Recently, my beautiful Nadia left me for an IS-2 named Chad, leaving me with the twins and an infant T-70. I'm spending a small fortune on oil pans alone. So sign up today and lob shells across the battlefield with the whole family. And don't forget to add Tanktastic to get your free T-127, that sweet, sweet gold, and that hot premium action. The beginning of the not-yet-Soviet experience with tanks began with the Russian Empire in World War I. Yep, that record is still broken. Shocker, right? A Russian move for motorization began a bit earlier though, about 10 years before the start of the war, with a few vehicles, most notably the French Nakashidez Chiron armored cars, later adding some domestic designs here and there. Russia at this point though was not as industrialized as many other powers, and this lagging behind would give them trouble for a few decades, but we'll get back to that later. These pre-war motorization efforts though were very successful, even being well liked and supported by the more traditional generals in the Tsar's army. As the war broke out though, and through the duration of it, mechanization was never at the level that was hoped for. As tanks debuted mid to late war, Russia like many of the powers experimented with their own domestic designs, ranging from your basic World War I okay to bad to what the fuck is that, to out of the box horrendous designs. Although even early on you begin to see how differences in Russia's needs that are imposed by its terrain influence vehicle design, something that I think will be a theme going on, and something first highlighted, at least in my opinion, of the Tsar tank. What a twist! I've already done a video specifically on this, and I'll link it on screen, but the Tsar tank is the first of what will become many examples of a vehicle that makes absolutely no sense on the Western Front, but may have proven at least somewhat useful on the vast flat steppes of Russia if implemented. This is definitely a very out there design, and its usefulness in general is questionable, but a high position mobile machine gun nest able to move around with a good bit of ease on flat frozen Russian earth does actually somewhat stand to reason. And keep this idea of specific eastern needs in mind as we move along in the video. The first models of what you would picture as traditional World War I tanks showed up in the form of Lend-Lease to the White Army and tanks brought in by the invading foreign powers that made it to the Red Army as captures. The first Russian production tank was what a lot of other powers did post-World War I, basically a copy of the FT in the form of the T-18 or MS-1 light tank. After the end of the Russian Civil War and wars with Poland, industrialization began, and with this, so did more tank production. The use of foreign tanks by the interventionist forces made the Red Army feel it needed to be ready to fight these types of forces from across the globe, and made domestic tank forces a very important part in their view of future warfare to defend the Soviet Union. And this began with other foreign models being imported and copied with some changes by the Soviets expanding their arsenal including the Vickers 6-tonner becoming the T-26, that itself had a lot of additional variants built, as well as the BT or Fast Tank series of vehicles that were based off an American design by J. Walter Christie, which I have also touched on in another video. The BTs were a somewhat strange but rather revolutionary design using the eventually very widely used suspension system that Christie came up with, along with a nicely sloped front and the ability to go ridiculous speeds both with and without tracks. The Soviets also experimented with some multi-turret designs, uh, the T-28 and then also the T-35 heavy tank. The vehicles were paired with the emerging Soviet thinking of deep battle, spearheaded by a few Soviet commanders, most notably Tukhachevsky. 
and it was in the latter half of the decade that they could finally be put into the test. Soviet tank divisions at Nomohan delivered a crushing victory to the Japanese, stopping the IJA's northern turn and keeping them out of Mongolia, after a less than promising performance in the Spanish Civil War in the years prior. Although their failure there was determined to be more because of Spanish usage than the vehicles themselves. Cracks began to show, though, in the Polish campaign, where coordination between different parts of the army was often poor, leading to unsupported tank attacks in certain points, and an overall very average performance from the Red Army. You've got to coordinate! Uh -huh. These problems would come to a head in the Winter War, where a poorly executed, overly complicated plan, combined with even more failures to coordinate, led to an embarrassing campaign for the Soviets in terrain where tanks were not able to maneuver very well and got bogged down very easily. And along with some poor performance from vehicles, as they were starting to show their age now, a good portion of this can be blamed on some inept commanders promoted into the power vacuum left in the army after the purges that claimed many promising Red Army commanders, including Tukhachevsky. In the few years leading up to, and while, these conflicts were playing themselves out, newer models of Soviet tanks were being developed and first coming online at the tail end of the Winter War, including the KV series, 1 and 2, that would serve as breakthrough and bunker buster tanks respectively, replacing the T-26 in the infantry support role, and beating out the SMK and T-100 tanks for the spot. The Soviets just couldn't let those multi-turrets go. Along with the evolution of the BT series, the T-34, that in its development had become a kind of universal tank concept. These tanks became the focus point in the reorganization and modernization of the Red Army, as one of the lessons learned from these conflicts was that heavier, more modern vehicles will be needed. And these changes would end up being exactly what the Soviet Union needed for its military at the time. However, as these changes began to take effect, and these newer models began to come online, a rather significant emotional, emotional event. event would take place. Hitler made a rather big oopsie in the summer of 1941, and the narrative that is always repeated about this time is that as the Germans tore through the Soviet Union, they were shocked and amazed at these two models of tanks, three if you count the KV-2, that were nearly impervious to their anti-tank guns, could almost not be stopped, and used amazing technological breakthroughs such as sloped armor. And this is a huge sensationalization of what actually happened. The KV-1, 2, and T-34 were very new models when the Germans invaded, and the Soviets were desperately short of them for what they needed to completely re-outfit the army. The majority of what the Germans ran into was everything else. The old T-26s, BTs, T-35s, and all the lesser known stuff you see trashed on the side of the road and all the pictures of Operation Barbarossa. All the old stuff the Soviets were trying to shift away from, but hadn't had the opportunity to yet because they were caught in transition. And when the Germans met these older models, they typically wiped the floor with them. The old problem with poor coordination had not gone away, and there were still lots of unsupported attacks by these outdated tanks that fell prey to the Germans. When T-34s and KVs were met, it certainly was this big emotional event, especially in the beginning when they hadn't quite gotten their heads around how to kill the things yet. But this was rare, and the early designs, specifically the T-34, were not quite as amazing and war-winning as they would eventually become. And some of the features that are touted as being groundbreaking aren't necessarily so, the big one being the sloped armor. People talk about this as if God himself descended from the clouds and imparted this grand wisdom on the Soviet tank designers. The only problem is it is not a new concept. Check a look. This tank has sloped armor. This tank already had sloped armor. Look at these World War I tanks. Holy fuck, there's some slopes. And some people often counter that by saying it was a big deal that it sloped everywhere. But oh shit, look at this French tank. Look at them damn slopes on all the sides. What? So sloped armor was known about before this, even sloping on all sides. It was just very rare and something designers didn't necessarily take advantage of all the time because it cuts the internal space down of the vehicle by a lot, especially on the sides where you make the turret ring have to be smaller and you really limit how big your turret can be. So this wasn't an ancient secret protected by the monks that only the Soviets found out. Like everything else, it comes with ups and downs. That being said, the trade-off was very much worth it for what the T-34 was, but it did make for one hell of a cramped interior. The early T-34s also had a pretty bad crew layout with the commander having to serve two functions and some other issues such as poor gunnery optics, along with just the broad mechanical issues that come with any new design as it's being worked out, something that the KV-1 and 2 suffered from as well. So they're kind of a mixed bag. What changes this though is what the Soviet military does with the designs once they realize the rather poor predicament they're in. 
After the invasion, as many factories as possible are packed up onto trains, usually along with their workers, and sent from the western portion of Russia into the east out of imminent German threat. But once they are set up, the Soviet command makes an extremely hard-hearted and you could almost say cruel decision, but one that is incredibly necessary for the war they find themselves in. They realize that they are in a war of attrition, with no quarter asked or given, and they decide they are going to do everything they can to put as many tanks possible on the front lines as quickly as possible. Instead of continuing to create this vast number of tanks for really specialized purposes, they file them down to a handful of models that can get the job done, utilizing only three chassis designs to simplify the production process. For example, they get rid of vehicles like the KV-2. It's a specialized bunker buster for offensive operations. We don't need it. Throw it out. And ironically, after all the losses in 1941, all the models that would no longer be supported had taken a lot of losses, and the Soviets could very quickly adapt to this more streamlined amount of tank types rather quickly, as every tank in the country was thrown against the Germans when they came rolling in, and not a lot made it out. Just about enough to continue the defense and hold over the troops while the factories are being moved and being reset back up. They also do absolutely everything they can to simplify and remove the quantity of required parts from vehicles, reducing the cost and time it takes to create these things. And this gets into the other big thing that they did in their design, which is called planned obsolescence. Meaning that after studying how long a certain tank, like a T-34 on average, would be alive once it was in combat, they would create the tank in a way that the sum of its parts wouldn't outlive what that average time would be. So you're not going to put any fantastic, never going to break, will always run no matter what the condition engine into a T-34 because it'll probably have been totaled in one way or another long before the engine runs out. And all the time and effort put into that engine to make it run so well would just be wasted time. And as kind of brutal as this decision is, it makes it to where the Soviets are producing tanks at ridiculous levels, that they are just completely overwhelming the Germans, who have decided to do the exact opposite and take these incredibly complex, well-built-to-run-forever, retiree car-esque tanks into the field that are going to get destroyed just as fast as the Soviet vehicles are. It's an attritional war. Don't take what you can't afford to lose, or something that it's lost will significantly reduce your ability to fight to it. Because of this, T-34s and Soviet tanks in general from World War II really get a reputation of breaking down too easily and not being of any quality. And they definitely were crude, but this didn't really bother the Soviet tankers. And it's in big part to this huge cultural difference between the West and the East. In the West, quality means something that's going to run forever. And in the East, quality means more something that's easy to repair. Really embracing the fact that nothing's going to run forever, so instead of hoping that things will last for a really long time and dreading the day that things do break down on you, you expect the breakdowns. Spend five minutes on a fix, then you're on with your day. And the numbers of estimated repaired Soviet tanks are really a testament to this. So say T-34 breaks down 50 kilometers into an advance. You would dive in, swap a few interchangeable parts, and then you're off. And in the meantime, because there's so many of the things, the crew can probably just hop into another one and keep the division at full strength. Whereas a panther kills its final drive 150 kilometers in, and you suddenly have a mechanic on suicide watch. So the Soviets take this idea, utterly dominate the production game, and take it home to Berlin. And along the way, are still developing new vehicles, as the big dick race for armor ratchets up countering the big cats with additional models derived from the KV-1, eventually becoming the IS and IS-2, and upgrading the T-34 with a bigger turret, giving it a more powerful gun and a much more effective crew layout, adding a fifth man. Ending the war debuting the boogeyman of the East, the IS-3, the heavy tank that scared the West for like 10 years, it's hilarious. With large amount of tanks being able to be in the field the whole war, just as they need to be in a war where all bets are off and everything can be lost. And although caught flat-footed and in transition at the invasion, the Red Army learns to use these vehicles with great proficiency, leaping through German lines in offensive after offensive from late 42 onward, ending the war with one of the premier armored forces around. And because of this, I would say that Soviet tanks are easily some of the best of the war. Really for the exact reasons people say they're the worst. That they were crude, planned to break, and were made to have short lifespans. Because those made them perfectly adapted to the war they found themselves in. And allowed the factories to ignore bells and whistles and focus on what matters once you have a competent design in a large conflict. Numbers. 
There's probably an hour's worth of additional things I could go on about Soviet tanks, like the lost numbers and what they mean, Lend-Lease tanks and what overall effect and influence that had on the victory, or just more into designs and how they evolved over time. Or I could go into the Cold War and talk about how every Bush war ever has been sponsored exclusively by Soviet tanks. Live leak video means someone dies, so skip. But I think I'll leave it here. What do all of you think? Do you think this was a good way to fight the attritional war? Or do you think at the end of the day, it's a little too much willful sacrifice for the few for the many? And be sure to let your bias flags fly. I know I did. As I dictated this script and all the Soviet garb that was at my disposal, this would be fun. To my new mail-order bride, Najezhda, all while trying to recreate the pace and living of her old home as she adjusts to our very different world. Davai! Davai! Thanks again to World of Tanks for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in the game, be sure to sign up at the link below for all kinds of free stuff. And I'll see you in July for the penultimate episode of this series. I mean, I'll be doing stuff in between now and then, but not gonna do one of these... one of these tank vid... You know what I mean, fuck. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this image before on some sort of forum or news feed. And you might have wondered for these big claims being made where these numbers came from. And the answer is, frankly, very unreliable places. German tank ace kill numbers come from two main places. Claims from the crews themselves and memoirs or field reports, or propaganda pieces from the Times.